All right. What's up, y'all? How y'all doing? It's Nick with being with the Steam. Uh, 100 subscribers. So we are here. Um, I'm just trying to get everything going with the technical aspect. Please uh, bear with me. Um, let's see here. But, uh, how's it? How y'all doing? It's Nick being with the Steam. Uh, 100 subscribers. So we are here. Um, I'm just trying to get. I'm getting everything going. Please, uh, please bear with me. But uh, yeah. Uh, hours, so we are here. Um, okay. What's up, y'all? So uh, today, uh, I am blessed to have 100 subscribers to my YouTube channel. Um, I am currently just trying to get my views up. I've been working on and off from work, school, and everything. But uh, but yeah. So today I got a couple topics for today. One, um, when it comes to my Black Panther fan fiction uh, series, I'm still working on that hardcore, and just trying to get everything just going. So uh, first off. Um, I saw an article when I was at work a couple of days ago, and it was related to, I want to say, the Black Panther comic books. And um, I'm going to pull it up here on my phone. Let's see here. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, give me a second. Please bear with me. Um, okay, here we go. So Black Panther 3 must still happen to end the franchise. And this is from Screen Rant. So the future of the MCU might see fewer sequels, but after Black Panther Wakanda forever, a thorough film must happen to bring Wakanda's story to an end. All right, I'm gonna end right. I'm gonna stop right there. Um as we all know, uh Black Panther Black Panther 2, not three, uh was a bomb in my opinion. And I'm pretty sure anybody who went to go see it previously, it was a bomb to you as well. Um, I do believe the way that they have portrayed the MCU for Black Panther, Black Panther franchise in itself, they shot themselves in the foot. And that was because, and I might ruffle some feathers with this, they put all their coins into Chadwick Boseman because they have this whole ordeal where they will not cast somebody else or not have a backup actor for their lead character. And the problem that they, I mean, it, it showed for itself. You want to pay homage to somebody, but the way that you do it what, by incorporating a actor's death into a movie is not the way you go about it. And then when you look at the comic books, you go even further to basically destroy the character that's been around for now 60 years and make it to where it's almost like it's non-existent uh i saw one uh article today where it said that black panther uh t'challa specifically was not going to be king of wakanda anymore um wow when i saw that I have to say I was taken aback because I'm like, okay, so we're just going to cut him out of Wakanda completely. Knowing that there has not been another king announced for the king of Wakanda, nor queen, even though everybody likes to go back to Shuri, which in and of itself is confusing to me because you're not really doing anything with her and you didn't even set her up the right way in the MCU because once again, you are not doing the story right now when it comes to just being a avid comic book fan and knowing the source material you had so much to do you set up secret invasion with nick fury which t'challa plays a major part in that and when it comes to secret invasion in and of itself 
T'Challa went against scrolls. He had scrolls to try to invade Wakanda. You had two scrolls in, I think, um, in the Earth Mighty Hero, Earth Mightiest Heroes uh, TV series, you had it to where they adapted the scroll comic book storyline to where you had two scrolls trying to impersonate Storm and T'Challa. When that happened, they got their heads cut off to the point where they had an unknown illness to where Wakanda could, quote unquote, not understand what it was because it was a scroll illness. So, and I would do, I remember seeing this on, um, I remember seeing this on uh, Twitter a while back where they said that um, the illness that scroll T'Challa is uh, dying from was related to the snap, which really didn't make any sense. But I'll just say that in some regards to the way that they portrayed, well, they tried to put it in the movie, but as we know, that didn't work. And the explanation behind that was you had T'Challa who was not, who did not have the heart-shaped herb in his system. But we clearly as day saw it in Endgame when he came back, was undusted, thanks to the efforts of the remaining Reveng Avengers, not Revengers, but they had the rest of the Avengers bring everybody back. And after that, you see T'Challa, who's one of the very first ones to come back after Sam is shown to be flying and comes to the aid of Captain, uh, Captain America, Steve Rogers, at the end of Endgame, near the end, of course, but they fight 2014 version of Thanos. So you have that, you have a whole bunch of other stuff that is pushed towards ending the whole character. And like I said before in the beginning of this stream, when you put your chips on one actor and you don't have anybody else that you can basically see as T'Challa, you end up with this problem. Yes, you pay homage to the actor who started it. The key word there was start. That don't mean you end his character. You don't end the character arc. The character's been around longer than the actor, been around longer than all these actors that are in Hollywood now. So what you do with that is you take a you take an actor that has been looking for a opportunity to cut their teeth on a role that's going to get them some paper and continue the stories that you have already going. Because all of phase four has been nothing but trash. And I have to say that I had my hopes up for Dr. Strange, Multiverse of Madness, but that was a slap in the face too, because when they did the Illuminati, that was supposed to be comprised of Reed Richards. They did, they did well with that. You had, um, uh, let's see, who else? Who else did you have? You had, uh, let's see. You had a whole bunch of stuff going on. And the one thing that I always say is when you don't read the source material and you just decide to go willy-nilly with it, you mess up. And that in and of itself tells me that people don't really want to listen. They don't listen to logic. Hold on. I'm trying to see what's going on here. Uh, uh, your check. All right, I'm back. Uh, hmm. So, comic book news for Black Panther. Uh, um. So, one other thing that I've been thinking about that comes to mind for um the future of the black panther franchise um is the character development and the stories that they could use um one thing that comes to mind is 
as we always say, is the recast option. Um, Wonder Man. They have used, uh, let's see. Yabya Abdul Mateen Dabar II was cast as Wonder Man. Um, as we all know, a Wonder Man series is being developed and they're underway with, I guess, production. And Wonder Man is supposed to be a love interest to Wanda Maximoff. And the funny thing about Wanda Maximoff is I've seen her throughout phase, I think, phase, yeah, phase two of the MCU when she was brought in from uh, Ultron. And even from that standpoint, you don't have anything that's really st stuck with her. You had Vision. She lost Vision. She lost a brother, which really she shouldn't have because the twins, the Maximoff twins, are integral to storylines. They're, integ they're integral to the MCU, well, I'm sorry, the X-Men storyline because you're about to introduce mutants. Now, when it comes to Pietro Maximoff, I'll be honest, I don't know much about him. I have not read that much about him, but I do know that he is, of course, the son of uh, Magneto. And they have a third sibling called, called Polaris. And that was uh, shown in the um, Gifted, the Gifted uh, TV series from FX. And even with that, with uh, Polaris, you had so many Easter eggs in that series where you showed her to be related to Magneto to the point where she was able to destroy a plane from far away, which that's not, that's, to be honest, just hardcore. And when you tack that on to the, just the blissfulness of the stories that are told within Marvel Comics, you have a plethora of ideas that can be put from paper to film. And that's all due to creative writing. And what's funny is I'm taking that class and I know from a just a creative standpoint, there's a lot of not only things that has to be has to go into writing these films. And the one thing that I always constantly try to keep in mind is not everything can be put from comics to the films, but I digress. If you're trying to be a comic book company, you have to follow the social material because that's literally your script right there. You find somebody who follows the comic books who are reading the comic books. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't do that. Do you, Nate Moore? My bad. I'm sorry. I don't. I'm, I'm sorry. You don't do that. But then again, you had the Russo brothers when they portrayed T'Challa in the very first his very first outing. You did a, they did a better job than Ryan Coogler. I'm sorry. That's the truth. Ryan Coogler's T'Challa does not, even though it's it's continuation of T'Challa from Civil War, you didn't have that bravado, you didn't have that swag, you didn't have all of that that came from Civil War T'Challa. And like Theo B and um, Daryl, I'm sorry, B Real D Real, you had all these people that read the comics from the 70s and they knew right then and there from Civil War up until now, there was a huge change that really, I'd say, it was, I don't want to say it's bittersweet, but it was just eye-opening because you had things that were changed, like, for example, and uh, I like Theo um, when he says this, who the hell is in Jobu? <laughs> like, really, who is in Jobu? We don't know anybody named Jobu from the comics. You had uh, you had Njobu, and then you had T'Chaka. You had T'Chaka kill his so-called brother, and you had Killmonger be the cousin of the royal family of T'Challa and Shuri. That in and of itself shows me that you did not read the comic books. When Ryan Hooger said on the podcast in an interview that he read the whole crate of comic books that were Black Panther comic books, even from Jungle Action, I believe you mentioned, you didn't read those. Because if you did, you would see that Scion was an integral part to everything that happened with T'Challa. Even to the point where um, in Doom War, which that's where, what's ironic is Doom War is where both uh, Scion, um, uh, Wakabi, 
and uh, who else? Wakabi, Sion, Wakabi, and uh, Zuri. All three of them perish in Doom War. And that's due to them sacrificing themselves to protect who? The royal family. And so you have at the, I um, believe, one issue that Theo B went over with was he was mourning Wakabi and Zuri because they died in battle. And the whole time that everybody was dealing with um, uh, Wakabi and uh, Zuri's death, you had Storm that was in this comic. I mean, yeah, Storm was in the story. And then you had the Fantastic Four come in later, and then you had Sue Storm and uh, Storm, Sue Storm and Storm go at, well, not really go at it, but they're on a separate adventure. And then you had T'Challa, who was in a coma at the beginning of the story. But during this whole entire plethora of storytelling, you had someone in the background pulling the strings, and that was who? Doom. The very first few things that I heard from Wakanda Forever was there was going to be a Doctor Doom after credit scene. We didn't get that. Instead, we got Toussaint, which really didn't make sense at all. All you were trying to do was trying to quote unquote appease fans saying, oh yeah, we're going to have another T'Challa, but it's not the T'Challa you want. Last time I checked, when you do that to fans or customers, you lose business. And that's exactly what's happened with the MCU and Disney now. They're losing business because you put your chips on Wakanda Forever for making so much money. It didn't make money. And then after the plethora of other shows that you come out with and projects, you see one, two, and three, She-Hulk was bad. Uh, what else? Captain Marvel didn't do good. Uh, I'm sorry, not Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel. That didn't do good. Uh, what else? Ant-Man didn't do good, and I didn't even see that movie. Yes, I did not go see Ant-Man because it was trash, in my opinion. And the one thing that I have um, noticed about the quality is uh, the storytelling is not there. I, I remember reading one thing about, um, what's the man? The guy who wrote the Ant-Man 3 film. Uh, let's see, I'm going to pull it up on my phone right here. Uh, what, what's it? What is? Oh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, what is it? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Uh, where is it at? Where is it at? Hitman 3 Rider Mox fans. Here it is right here. Here we go. All right, here we go right here. This is uh, from the direct. The writer for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Manny has revealed that he refuses to listen to fans regarding the criticism of MODOK. Now, Modoc, um, I will say, looks like a Spy Kids character. We can all agree to that. That's part of the reason why I did not go see this film. Um, I know that the continuation for Modoc was set up in the first Ant Man film of 2015 when Darren Cross was literally squished into the quantum realm. And from the plot leaks from Ant Man, and this is spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, the plot leads that came out from Ant-Man 3, Kang, who was basically the main villain, of course, and introduced for being the main villain for Phase 4, which I'll get on that later. But MODOK was done poorly. Um, the memes and everything that's on the net and everything seems to be very, very controversial when it comes to, like this guy said, the fans know who Modoc is, what he's supposed to be. And when you basically slap the fans in the face and say, no, they're wrong, we don't want to do this. 
I, I, I didn't want to do that because I can do whatever the hell I want with Modoc. It doesn't sit well because Modoc is not only just the Ant Man villain, he's a whole, he, his, he's what I like to call a universal villain. You can have Ant Man go up against him, Iron Man, I think, I don't know if Black Panther is going against him. I don't, I don't want to say that. But Modoc is one of those universal villains that the Avengers have faced and different characters outside of the Avengers have come up against. Um, I'm going to go back and read this. Uh, while fans knew the floating head was going to feature in the newly released film, it seems many were still not prepared for him. For his MCU adaptation, the character was retconned into being Corey Stahl's Darren Cross, having survived the cat catastrophic defeat in 2015's original Ant-Man film. As it turns out, he survived his journey into the quantum realm and was saved, <laughs> but in all, by Jonathan Majors, Kang the Conqueror. Many fans have been vocal in their displeasure regarding his adaptation, both in how his story was handled and the VFX that went into building his look on screen. <laughs> wow. And if you can see, this is what he looks like. Yes, this is how bad he looks. Uh, fans, uh, I'm gonna read this section. Fans are wrong about Modoc. In an interview with Vital Thrills, Ant Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania writer Jeff Loveness shared his feelings on Modoc while standing firm on the MCU's adaptation of the villain. When asked if a variant of Corey Stahl's villain might show up as an Avenger, really, as an Avenger, okay, Loveness promised that if he did, he will be even stupider. The Avengers of the Kane Dynasty scribe stated that he refuses to listen to fans who want a more serious adaptation of the giant headed character. And this is his um, quoting verbatim here. Uh, if I say yes, I promise you he will be even stupider. I refuse to listen to the fans on this. I will not make Modoc serious. As long as I'm alive, they're not going to get that serious adaptation that those fans, that those four fans want. He'll be a big dumb head. That's all. Come on now. Come on. Oh, Lord. Jesus. Take the wheel, Lord. Mm, mm, mm. When it comes to this, I must say, this is crazy. And I mean, it is crazy. To the point where, wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So, and I'm going to equate this to what John really did to the Black Panther character, T'Challa, in, in his run. Because his run just ended, thank God. Um, This is what happens when you have people that don't give a crap about any source material history. This is history in the making. And the past history is what people are expecting to be adapted and not even be adapted, but just push forward in the coming, the coming of everything that is current projects and future projects. And when you have somebody like this who literally blatantly, arrogantly says they don't give a crap about what fans think, it just shows that you don't have people that, they don't hire people. And Nate Moore said this, they don't hire people that follow the comics, that read comics. They would rather have somebody that doesn't know crap about comics and put it in a movie that is supposedly made for comic book fans. How is that a business decision? That's not a good business decision. You have a business where you have a company who is catering to comic book fans. And this is Disney's biggest thing. They always cater to the fans. So how can you have someone Say they cater to the fans, but then you don't cater to them. You literally find people that do not read comics. Why? That, that doesn't make any sense. Your goal is to make money. Your biggest franchise, which is the Black Panther franchise, you take Ryan Coogler, who is known for putting black stereotypes in movies, he started with not. I'm sorry, not Trinity. I'm not gonna say that. He didn't start with Trinity. He started with 
Fruitvale Station, which is based on a true story. And his working relationship with Michael B. Jordan is honorable. It's, it's, it's good to mention, but when you pair those two and you put them in a movie where you literally have black death, but like I said, you have source material. Use your source material because that's going to be your biggest catch. You use that and you're I promise you, you have more people coming to the theater like you did with the phase one, two, and three, because that's how you build anticipation. All these projects you came out with in 2022, where you had literally 17 projects come out in one year. No, no. The anticipation that you had for Infinity War and Endgame, you made us wait a year to go see those movies. That's how you build anticipation. That's how you build suspense. That's how you build things that not only, how can I say this? Not only do you build up to a finale, because that's the best thing you did was build up to a finale. But at the beginning, you had what we like to call origins. You had literally standalone movies that made headway to where you're creating a universe. And I will say with DC, DC is kind of different because they're trying to restructure their whole entire deal. And my, my thing is when they made the very first Justice League movie and then you remade it with the Snyder Cut, which was, should have been, which should have been, I don't want to say, they put it on hold and it came out in the latter, in the first part of 2021. Uh, that was the best decision they could have had. Let and see, that's another thing you had after Zack Snyder's daughter committed suicide. He did what he went and grieved, he went and spent some time with his remaining family and grieved the loss of his daughter. Now, after that, you brought in somebody that had already been working for Marvel to finish Justice League. Do you see what happened with that? The whole internet called it the Justice League because what he took everything that Zack Snyder had already put in place and literally made it his own. He was brought in to finish the movie, not redo everything that somebody else had already put in place. And the storyline from the beginning to end was crap in his version. You had Everything that was shown, and I'm pretty sure once I get more tech savvy, I can do a whole video on this. You compare what he did in the Avengers, and then you compare what he did in the Justice League for 2017. And I promise you, if you go back and watch those movies, you will see bits and pieces of campy comedy put in from the Avengers, and you move it to the Justice League. The one scene where uh, you have the flash fall on top of one woman, and yeah, I'll just leave it at that. He falls on top of one woman and then immediately speeds off, and she's left delirious after so and so. That in and of itself was not only a sexual innuendo, but it was it wasn't called for. It really wasn't because the Justice League, the way the the way the DC universe was set up in, uh from Man of Steel to Batman v Superman, it was dark. So what you do with that is you continue that. Now, we only have one Justice League movie with all the characters that were put together. And even, even when Zack Snyder finished the film and put it to HBO Max, you still did not have everything that was supposed to be in that movie. Yes, you have Martian Manhunter, which he was supposed to be with the Justice League fighting not only Dark Side, but Steppenwolf, you should have had him with the Justice League. And I do like the way they had um, the guy who played him. You had him hiding in plain sight, which was good. And I like the Easter egg you had from the very first Man of Steel movie where he said that he thought he was alone. And to the point where you see how can I say this? You see um you see certain people in the uh, DC right now where they are trying to 
basically just redo the whole entire thing. And I saw a uh, news where, uh, let's see, hold on. I'm going to look this up because um, uh, uh, shoot. what is this? Uh, uh, gun. James Gunn. So, James Gunn, and this is Deadline, is supposed to uh, let's see. Gunn announced back in the fall when he took the DC job that was pinning a new Superman movie. Something Warner Bros. Discovery CEO David Zaslav is eager to see in that Henry Cavill will not be returning as the Man of Steel as the project deals with the character's early days. Superman Legacy tells the story of Superman's journey to reconcile his kryptonite heritage with his human upbringing as Clark Kent of Smallville. Why is this another origin story? Why? I, I don't get it. Why are we telling a whole nother origin story? And then to the point where you have Henry Cavill, who has been with the DC brand since 2013, and we haven't even had a sequel to his movie. We've had a sequel to Wonder Woman. We've had a sequel to, we're about to get a sequel to the Zam in the ne- in the coming uh, weeks, but we can't get a sequel to The Man of Steel, who you started off with. And then on top of that, you're making a Flash movie that comes out in June, and you're introducing Supergirl in a whole nother universe. Now, I will say with the Flash, um, that is not only a tricky and tricky situation, but it is very, very off-putting for me because not only have the news that's come out about Ezra Miller and his shenanigans, and then you have the premiere. Uh, I'm remember Planet Fanatics talking about this, and if you're in here, please, please say something because I, I'm pretty sure people can people can understand what's going on with this. Um, Ezra Miller, in my opinion, uh, is non-profitable, and the way that the movie is going. I'll just say this. When I first saw the trailer and I heard something about a dark flash, I was like, why in the world don't you have reverse flash in this? Do you know how many people have been fan casting reverse flash for this movie? And you go and you say, oh no, we don't want to, we don't want to do reverse flash. We just want to do Ezra Miller against Ezra Miller, which is funny because everybody knows that Ezra Miller, people have called Ezra Miller the real life reverse flash. And then I don't want to predict this, but it would be interesting if the reverse flash has Ezra Miller's face, but it ends up being the dude who plays um, Homelander from, from the boys. That would be nice, which in my opinion, that would be cool. But like, like the internet has always done, you fan cast so many people in these roles and then you do not come through with following through the story. Case in point, when everybody was fan casting John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic, and then on top of that, Marvel says, all right, let's do this. We're going to put him in Multiverse of Madness and put us Mr. Fantastic. Knowing he would like to play Mr. Fantastic, and then you put him in the movie as Mr. Fantastic. Then you decide to kill him off. Why? Not only that, his wife, who is who says she doesn't want to play a DC or a Marvel a superhero character, but she knows that she can pretty much make a lot of dough from doing that. And then everybody keeps saying we have literally posters that people have made online where they're saying, "Let's make them Mr. Fantastic and Mrs. Fantastic." It's the best thing. And one thing I will say that I have for my personal fan cast, I have both those the Krasinski, the Krasinski family. And then I have John uh, Zach Efron as a human fan, uh, yeah. human torch, and people were fan casting. Um, I guess John Cena to play the thing, but we all know, and and I'll just say this: I'll put this out there. Um, the original Fantastic Four. For, I'm, I'm talking about in my in my time. I'm not talking about the '80s, the the bad one. 
that they took off sort of completely. But I'm talking about um, the uh, the one with um, Ian Grifford, Chris Evans, uh, Jessica Alba, and uh, Michael Chiklis. Those people uh, played the perfect version of the Fantastic Four, in my opinion. And we don't talk about the one from 2015. No, we do not. We don't talk about that. So um, I'll just say there is a whole lot of things that can be done with uh, the Fantastic Four. And even with that, the Fantastic Four, like I said before, they connect to T'Challa and the Black Panther franchise. Uh, Camillo Kid, thank you for being here, man. Uh, you say you're not seeing the Flash. Um, Ezra makes it a hard pass for me. This is true. This is very true. Um, <laughs> Ezra Miller is, it's like something snapped in Ezra Miller after, well, before everybody was fired from the DC brand. And people have said that, uh, oh, I know. There was a TV spot that just came out for Shazam 2, uh, Fear of the Gods, where they show a scene with Gal Gadot's one woman being talking to Billy Batson, Shazam, and Zachary Levi. So we know that she's not going anywhere. Or are you just going to do the same thing you did with Henry Cavill and do a cameo and just fire her straight after and just cast somebody else? Because if you do that, then you definitely screwed. Because now it's a trend that you're starting to set where you have the actors that were from the past um, era of DC that didn't even finish the storyline. And you're just going to say, all right, the hell with them. We're not going to use them. Why? Like, I don't understand that. And to the point where, like I said, Zack Snyder filmed a Green Lantern series with Jon Stewart to be the final Green Lantern to show up. Well, not final, but the actual Green Lantern to show up in the very end of the film where you had Martian Manhunter show up. And you have, <laughs> which was funny, the reaction that Ben Affleck's Batman, Bruce Wayne, had to Martian, Man Martian Manhunter showing up. He was like, uh, okay, what the hell were you when we were fighting Steppenwolf? We could have used you. Like, really? Why were you not in the final fight with Steppenwolf? I do not get it. Like, it's it's funny to me because he shows up at the very end. It's like, okay, uh, okay, I was here the whole time, but um, I just didn't want to get involved just yet. So uh, I'm going to just let y'all ride it out and uh, take care of business. It, it's, the, it's the funniest thing to me, bro. Like, really. And... I'll say this about the CW. One word, I'm sorry, two, missed opportunities. Missed opportunity number one, John Diggle. He was supposed to be the John Stewart version on TV with Green Lantern. You had him pick up the Green Lantern ring at the end of, what was it? Um, was it uh, J-Dub? No shout out. Okay, what's up, J-Dub? Shout out to you, man. Um, but yeah, you had um, hmm. you had John Diggle, who was um, supposed to be John Stewart, which his name is John Stewart. It just used John Diggle. But you have that, and you had um, a whole bunch of things that were not told with his story. Uh, I will say the biggest missed opportunity in that whole entire Arrowverse was Black Lightning and Static Shock. Um, Black Lightning to me was, huh. Black Lightning to me was a gem because you decided to make one of the very, one of the very few black superheroes that came out in the beginning of comic book uh, history. You decided to make that TV show, but we all know people that read, read comics and knew what was going down was leading to Step by step, static shock. And I remember seeing a previous, uh, this is past, yeah, I think it was late or mid 2022, where Michael B. Jordan was supposed to make a static shock movie. And the one thing that I was hoping for was they were going to cast somebody in the Black Lightning TV show 
and have them take that actor who was playing Static Shock, take it to the movie, and then after they make the movie, make a TV show that connected with the Arrowverse. And I will say it's uh, it's not a sticky situation, but like I said, it all comes down to one thing, and that's writing. And the way that they did the writing for Black Lightning It was very, very, it wasn't, I don't want to say it was mild. It had its up and downs, but the thing that really tugged at me the most was you focused on the family aspect. Basically, it was a black version of The Incredibles. You had the mom who was a super scientist, very smart. You had the father who was, of course, Black Lightning, Jefferson Pierce. And you had the daughters, which were... Um, why do we get our bag? <laughs> Come on, kid. Why we did not get our bang babies? Well, um, I'll tell you why because nobody wants to read comics, nobody wants to, uh, nobody wants to actually do the work. And, um, I'm hold on, hold on. I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna pull something up because you're talking about bang babies. Where were the villains that we could have had? I will tell you the villains we could have had for uh, Static Shock. In, in the Black Lightning TV show. Let's see here. Static Shock villains. Let's see. You had Ivan Evans, better known as Ebon. Uh, you had uh, Talon. Let's see. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, Ebon. Now, Ebon could have been... Uh, here we go, right here. Ivan Evans... Elias Ebon, Static Shock, leader of the Meta Breed. Now, Shadow Transform. Uh, sh his powers are Shadow Transmorphic Body, Teleportation, Thought. He showed up in Static. No, sorry, not Static Shock, but Black Lightning for a brief cameo. If you watch the um end of um, if you watch the end of the I think it's one episode where there was a black dude that was actually teleporting. He was, I think he was Ebon. Because if um if you if you pay attention to it, you gotta go back and watch the uh series of Black Lightning because you have to pay attention to these things. You had an assassin who was on the trail to find, I think he was actually hunting down static shot. And I'm sorry, not static shot, but black lightning. And um it came apart. Uh, came to a, a head where they were trying to find out where Black Lightning was, this, that, and the third. And I want to say when they, um, he never showed up. <laughs> he never showed up in the series again. That was one of those things where you did not continue the story because there are so many dead ends with this, uh, with this series. You did not set up, uh, well, you had the setup to where, um, um shoot you had the setup to where uh, the last um the last name of uh black lightning's wife which was stewart monica or not monica lynn uh lynn stewart uh she is the sister to who diggle stewart so you could have had john diggle green lantern meet black lightning why? Even to the point where you had the uh, whole suit up uh, montage with um, all the superheroes that were in the DC uh, Arrowverse. You have them, and then you had at the very end, what did he say? Um, everybody has time for a suit up, but nobody wants to let the new guy power up. Like, come on, that was cool. And then to the point where uh, you had all the all the uh, Toms and the times where the shows came on and to the point where you had black lightning to his daughters, which they like to pay attention to. And you had that one funny, confusing episode where you had two lightnings. Why? I, I do not get that. Why did you have two lightnings? It did not make sense. You could have easily had static shock in that one episode. And 
what was the techno kid? Yeah, the techno kid that was in Static uh, Black Lightning. You had him. He could have. I guess he could have been Static Shock, but I looked up Static Shock. He's in Dakota. You could have easily just moved him to Freeland. That's where he is. That's where Black Lightning is. And that's what's funny is they did it better in the Young Justice series than they did in the live action. That tells you something. That tells me that more people are paying attention to the animated series where you have Young Justice do a better job of storytelling and connectivity than you do in your live action stuff, which does not sound good. Um, When it comes to Superman and Supergirl, they could have been faced off against Brainiac. You could have had Brainiac working with Darkseid as like a second wave for the Justice League to handle, but Superman is strong enough to where he's able to handle it with his cousin and nobody else. That would be great. And I will say, people don't pay attention to certain details in Titans because that's another show. Uh, yes, the CW was all over the place. Come on, you kid. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> the CW was all over the place. Um, you want to know why they're all over the place? Because they brought in the Flash's two kids. First, you have Nora, then you have the twins. Oh, Lord Jesus. The twins with uh, Bart and Nora. Eh, it was okay. But my thing was, where was Wally the whole time? After the dude came out as gay, you just said, all right, I don't want to be Wally anymore. I just want to do something different. Where is he now? He's about to show up just in a, just one episode in the very end of the Flash. And the whole time when Barry went into the Speed Force and he stayed there for I don't know how, of how many months or even close to a year, why did we not get one or two seasons where we see a development of Wally West become a stronger version of himself? He was already trained by Barry Allen when he first got his powers. So we have that. We have, um, uh, let's see, Barry Allen decides to train him in phasing. He decides to train him in, uh, shoot, I guess when Wally decides, Wally gets his power upgrade. I will say this. He does get a semi-power upgrade when he's with the Legends. And even to the point where he leaves the Legends and he finds another place to basically just chill out. And he gets more powers from namaste namaste that's where he gets his powers from he makes a so, quote-unquote stronger connection to the speed force through isolation and from my recollection i believe he spent some time in the speed force just like barry did but the only thing with him was it was a speed force prison it wasn't him just being in the speed force barry's just chilling in the speed force because he had to go there to chill out everything that was happening uh, after so and so, at the end of what season three or two? No, it was season four. They had to go into the Speed Force, and that in and of itself was crazy to me because the roles should have been reversed. Wally should have won the Speed Force. No, I'm sorry, no. Wally shouldn't have gone to the Speed Force because he was already in the Speed Force. But what he could have done was, like he did when he was in isolation where he decided to connect deeper, had a deeper connection to the Speed Force to where he mentioned that he could feel what was going on inside the Speed Force just like Barry could. And to the point where he confronted Barry and said, you are killing the Speed Force for what you did in Crisis. That in and of itself could have told somebody that Wally was not only a better version of himself after he came back from isolation but he had a excuse me he had a sort of um how can i say this a seventh sense to where the speed force became one with himself because as we know wally west is the prime speedster in the Justice League Unlimited series. Yeah, that's true, Kamoa Kid. He wasn't going to be uh, given that. 
Oh, because what? He's a black man. Funny how they brought in Wally West and made him black in 2014 at the very end of 2014 in season two with, uh, and this was around what? The new 52 run with Wally West when he was turned into a black Mexican character. And his suit was wrong. You gave him the suit at the very beginning of, uh, what was it? What was that run? Where they just literally did a whole other reboot. And um, it wasn't New 52. It was, uh, shoot, what was it? What suit did Wally West have? Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Rebirth. It was a Rebirth suit. DC Rebirth. That's the suit that you gave Wally West and put it in the Flash. And you made it to where everything that um uh, he had was, that's basically what it was. And the thing that gets me is you, it just doesn't make sense. My thing is with Wally West, you had a prime opportunity to not only give a brother a chance, well, you gave him a chance, but you didn't, uh, skip a toss. Thank you, man. Thanks for the 100. You didn't give Wally West enough, uh, not only shine, you gave him some shine where you had his own episode to where he was, um, I want to say uh, he was amped up to be the savior for his sister with Iris. And you didn't pay that off. You said that it was going to be Barry, which of course it was going to be Barry. But the thing about me, the thing with me is his speed levels were supposed to be better than Barry's. The only thing you said when he first came out was he was faster than when Barry was started. No, 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 no. What you could have done was, where was the tachyon training that Barry had to where he got faster to where he got fast enough to where he could jump to different realities? Where was that? Where was the, um, where was the uh, training with Jesse, uh, Jesse Quick, which was Harrison Wells' daughter from Earth 2? Where was that? You didn't train none of them on tachyon training to help them get faster because that's that would have been the best thing to do to the point where Jesse was um, – you did away with Jesse, which was stupid. Why would you do it away with her? It was very – it was Wally's girlfriend, and you decided to do away with that whole relationship, and that, to me, was lazy writing. I don't – I do not – I do not understand that. I don't understand that at all. You had it to where – um a speedster couple and then you just made wally single for the rest of the time that he was in the arrowverse and i'm pretty sure he hasn't found no other no other love interest um i will say one thing that i've thought about constantly is with static shock he could be in a love interest with uh lightning um on black lightning that could have been good because you did away with the whole Wally was supposed to be the overclocked version of Barry. Overclocked? Overpowered. I think you meant to say overpowered. Um, yes, he was supposed to be overpowered than Barry because, once again, it was supposed to be him and his connection to the Speed Force. All you did was you had that very weird-looking uh, thing where he made a Speed Force construct. And don't you no. Lord Jesus, that brought back a memory that I do not like. <laughs> the Speed family, the the Flash family, where uh, they had these Speed Force constructs, and you had this whole Power Rangers esque uh, fight between Godspeed and uh, um, Godspeed clones and the Flash family, where you had Iris a speedster, you had the twins, you had Jay Garrett, you had. Uh, Barry, you had the Speed Force incarnate. You literally had a physical version of the Speed Force. And that was the most confusing season of all when you had the forces. You had the forces have avatars. Why? Why would you make a physical version of that? Because last time I checked in the DC comics, you didn't have physical versions. They were just forces in themselves. You had the strength force. You had this force. You had that force. You didn't have no physical avatars of them. 
because when the Flash got a hold of those, he discovered them himself. Himself, because he's what a scientist and a um, what was it, a crime scene investigator, a forensics uh, officer. You only use that aspect of him in little to few to none episodes. You didn't do that. You just use oh yeah, I'm gonna just use speed and love and put that together, and that could be my driving force. No, that's not how it works. That's not how the source material works. He doesn't, I mean, yes, you made it to where the Flash is a lover, not a fighter. Barry threw down in the comic books, even to the point where in the in the animated series, he went up against Brainiac and did what? I'm sorry, no, that wasn't Barry. That was Wally West. My fault. My fault. That my fault. Yep, yeah, that was that wasn't that wasn't Barry. That was Wally. And um, even with that, what did Wally do? He ran all the way around the world to destroy Brainiac. That was a fusion of Brainiac and Lex Luthor. But I digress. That was something that was done correctly. The golden age of cartoons and everything from the Justice League Limited to Static Shock series to the Batman series to all the shoot, a whole bunch of Batman series, even to the point where you have the Brave and the Bold. And I will say, James Gunn is my problem with giving me a headache because what he's doing with the DC brand to where he's calling the DCU, which I don't mind. It sounds cool, DC Universe. DCEU, DCEU was kind of extensive, but the whole thing where you had um, huh. I'll say this, they worked, they wanted to go young with the DC brand to the point where you have it to you have to create a whole another young cast for the movies. The one question I have is okay, so James Gunn is saying he's adapting the um Men of Tomorrow. Well, not Men of Tomorrow, I'm sorry. The DC uh um Superman, what was it? Superman what? Hold on, I'm gonna look that up. Uh let's see. Superman James Gunn. Um he is adapting uh the Superman his uh, the movie called Superman Legacy, but he is adapting the um oh shoot. Uh what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Hold on, let me see what this is. Uh what comic book is James Gunn adapting for Superman? Uh, All Star Superman. That's the comic book that he's using for the Superman movie that he that he's creating for his new universe. Um, I will say uh, that's cool in and of itself, but that is kind of a one off for me. Because if you make, if you adapt that movie for your Superman, that's gonna be like a, a cliffhanger at the very end of the at, the at the end of the movie, because he flies straight into the sun, because he's a nuclear bomb in and of itself, and then you show him at the very end he's quote unquote fixing the sun. Why? I I don't get it. Why are you gonna use that comic book? in and of itself to create your whole entire universe because to me what you're going to do is you have the batman and what he said when he came out with his announcement with all these other um yeah it is going to be goofy um it just doesn't make sense to me because uh i'll say this when in Titans, you had Superboy. Where was Superman? Where was... I know one thing. You could have had Wally West be in Titans, and that would have... that The Titans series probably would be going well today if you would have had Wally West on the team with the... um Basically, with the Team Titans. That would have been better. Because to me... um that would have brought in more people that would have been attentive to the series. You have this whole thing where you're 
amping up Nightwing, which I don't mind. You amp up Red Hood. You bring in a good version of Red Hood. You bring in a good version of Nightwing. But where was Damien? Where was all these other characters that have been established to where you had other animated movies that did well and they're still doing well to this day? Um, What's the next uh, animated movie that's coming out for DC? Let me see. Upcoming DC movies. Upcoming animated DC movies. Let's see here. Here we go, right here. All right. Oh, here was one. The uh the um let's see. What was it? You had uh let me see, let me see, let me see. Okay, you got Batman the Doom that came to Gotham. You have that. I remember seeing that one. You have um the Legion of Superheroes, you have that one that's coming. You have uh what else? Justice League War World. I didn't hear about that. I haven't, I haven't heard about that before. You have uh I don't know what that is, but um Batman Aztecia Choco de Imperios. I've never heard of that. Um what's the previous uh DC movie that just came out? Uh Justice League Dark. You have um, all these other recent um, Justice League movies that came out. Um, hmm. Excuse me. Uh, what else? What else? What else? What else? Hmm. Let's see. Animated movies. You had, uh, I will say this, Injustice was different. I will say Injustice was really different. Um, Injustice to me was different because I remember watching the games that they had uh, for Injustice, of course. It was adapting the Injustice video game. Um, hmm. Injustice to me was very subpar. You killed off the Flash, which never happened in the injustice movie you had um you had it to where basically the joker was a grittier version of batman to where he was killing off heroes that he had no business killing off and he couldn't have killed off you had to the point where and i'll say i'll go back to the flash when you kill off the Flash in the very first minutes of the movie to where the Flash is literally going through the city trying to find out what's going on and you have him having the toxin, he ingested the toxin, what happened in the CW version of the Flash? What did he do? He vibrated to the point where it came out of the system. Why didn't you do that with uh, Barry? You had a blade cut him in half, or not cut him in half, cut off his head. To where you black that out. I don't understand how that even worked. I don't understand. I really don't understand that at all. Because. Um, and then at the very end. You have him do the Seneca Superman move. Against uh, the other Superman. And when Lois st steps out of a portal. That Mr. Terrific. And that's another thing. Mr. Terrific is very smart. But you. Hmm. You have Lois say that Clark values life, and that's what stops him. Because another another Lois from another Earth is able to basically talk sense to him, which makes sense. But at the same time, it's a thing where um, it's just different. Because to me. You didn't have a lot of key players in that whole entire storyline. You didn't have the regime. You didn't have that. You you built up to that, but you never actually went along with it. You had the part where the Justice League was disbanded and people that supported Superman with Superman and people that were with, um, yeah, it is called inconsistent writing. But you didn't have 
this, that, and the third that was supposed to be in the Injustice movie, and you only made it an hour and some change. If you're doing animation, I'll say it like this. Injustice should have been a animated show. That's what it should have been. Because if you're trying to adapt a video game, that's what you do. A video game uh, story that has been dished out against uh, across two video games, and then you have it to where the Injustice series is going with a whole nother direction, you do not take one, you don't do a one take on that. That's not a one take. That's a whole, you, you rush the whole entire process. <laughs> uh, come on, you're funny. Did Kugler write it? Huh. You know, I don't think he did because he didn't have the key concept of Black Death. You didn't have the key concept of uh, um, a kid being left uh, by his dad. You didn't have um, this, that, and the third. But you sure enough had that in the Black Panther franchise. You made everything that was supposed to be uh, the antithesis the antithesis of going against the Black stereotypes that's in America. And you just threw that into the second movie. But I'll get on that later. Um, the DC Universe is what it's called now for movies. Um... I don't know anybody that can play Superman. And see, that's the thing. The people who, I don't want to say, well, shoot, I can say it. I grew up on the DCEU. I grew up on Henry Cavill. I grew up on Wonder Woman. I grew up on those things and carried through 2017 to now. I'm still thinking what they could do with the DC universe with the actors that have already been established. You have Ben Affleck playing Batman. Even to the point where he's going to direct the Brave and the Bold, where they're introducing Damien, which where they're introducing the Bat family. There's not been any setup to where the Bat family could be introduced. Because if you do the Batman family, the Bat family, you need the Luke, you need the Fox kids. You did a good job. And what's funny is you didn't introduce Fox, not at all, with Ben Affleck's Batman. You didn't introduce that. You had the man from uh, Morgan Freeman who did a great job playing Lucas Fox, uh, Lucius Fox, in uh, Nolan's trilogy. Who who supplied? Well, not really supplied. He was a tech genius that had all the gadgets that that, that the Wayne Company already had, the military grade tech that he already had, and you had that with um, uh, Chris, uh, Christian Bale's Batman. But when you brought in um, uh, Affleck's Batman, Batfleck, you did not uh, do due diligence with introducing the person behind the tech that's helping him. Because that was the whole thing. The writing, I will say, Christopher Nolan's Batman is great because the writing was good. You had, um, you had the... Uh, company, his company was going to try to blackmail him because they were trying to figure out where's all this funding going? Where's all this money going? It's the side it's the side stories that added to the anticipation of the overall story that made sense. Even to the point where um, you had a, you had the one executive, though, I think it was what, the CFO that went to Lucius Fox and said, I know uh, what you're building for him now, rocket ship? That was a, uh, what was it? It was an Easter egg to what? Batman v Superman or Batman and Superman Public Enemies because that movie came out during this time when it was Batman v Superman or the Batman, it was the, uh, what was it? The, oh, uh, shoot. Uh, what was it? What's the, um, mm, mm, mm. Uh, it's, it's not the dynamic duo. It's another one. What is it called? Shoot, shoot, shoot. Uh, I want to say it's the uh, the greatest. I don't know what the, what the name is, but um, you had it to where the duo between Batman and Superman they team up on multiple occasions. And oh, oh shoot, not Earth's Finest. Is it Earth's Finest? It might be Earth's Finest. That's the name of it, Earth's Finest. 
Um, yeah, I don't. It might be Earth's finest. I don't know. But um, you have those two, and even to the point where in the CW you mentioned that with Superman and not Superman, but uh, Supergirl and Batwoman. Uh, which you had uh, Kate Kane, excuse me. But you have, um, okay, I'm back, y'all. You have Kate Kane, uh, who, hmm. you have Kate Kane, uh, who was a, hmm. Kate Kane was a cousin to Bruce Wayne. And rest in peace to uh, the guy who voiced and played Batman. Uh, you had him. Uh, meet Kate Kane before he passes away. I'm sorry. Yeah, passes away. But you have that alternate reality Batman. And you pay homage to that. And then you make Batwoman Black, which was another version of Batwoman, which I don't mind that. That's cool. But the thing about this whole woke agenda, I'll get in on that for a sec. Hmm. World's finest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kimolo Kid. It's world's finest. It is world's finest. Um, hmm. Let's talk about woke. Being woke. What are we being woke about? Because um, with the MCU and the way that it's been portrayed for phase four where the internet was calling it the mcu was very scary to me because i remember uh we always like to say um it's the boys club and i will say yes it has been that but the representation between just genders and please don't get me started about that because I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I'm not trying to get canceled before I get started. Um, <sighs> it's just very funny to me how the MCU has taken a nosedive in content wise. Um, the way that the storytelling has been made to be, and I will say it started with Captain Marvel, because Captain Marvel, to me, was a good movie, but it was supposed to be a semi-origin story for Nick Fury and the way that he came from the Avengers. The idea of the Avengers Initiative, you got it from Carol Danvers and her whole thing, and this is how I know people that read comics. Um, you have the Avengers name on Kara Danvers' plane that she had when she was in the Air Force on Earth. You have that. She's part of Project Pegasus, which was connected to the Space Cube, the Tesseract. And she got a power from the Tesseract. Okay, that's one thing. You have Marvell, who's turned into a female, and it was supposed to be a male. Because I didn't have to read the comic books, and I know they changed everything, and I mean everything, from that comic book to that movie. Marvell was turned into a woman. Um, you had uh, the guy who was, um, oh shoot, I forgot his name. Let's see, uh, cast of cast of cast of Captain Marvel. Uh, Captain Marvel. Okay, here we go. The cast of Captain Marvel: Jude Law, Yan Rog. So Yan Rog, and that's another thing. Where was the? After credit scene for um where was the after credit scene for um the 
message per se where she disconnected herself when she went to uh, uh what was it um super saiyan mode i would call it like that because i forgot the name where she went super saiyan and she disconnected herself from the uh the artificial intelligence um that was basically the god of the not Shia Empire, the um oh shoot, what was it? Oh, I forgot the name. But uh oh the Cree, the Cree, yeah, the Cree, the Cree Empire. The uh Cree Empire that um they had uh that she was connected to the Cree Empire and they were going against the scrolls. There was a whole Cree scroll war that was going on and the scrolls were on earth as refugees but the funny thing is they're trying to take over the earth because in secret invasion in that series and that uh disney plus um it's not gonna be a movie it's gonna be a series in that whole series you have a whole bunch of kree that are revolving around one person and then to the point in the captain marvel movie itself you make hints that the scroll dead body that was on the table the guy who plays um the guy who plays uh who was it talos you make reference to he says this i'm going to finish what we started how can you make a reference to that and then not follow through with it i mean yes you're making secret invasion but he was playing nick fury throughout the phase throughout phase three into phase four where was this? Do we have? Yes, we have now. They have. Uh, I'm gonna just say it. They have this thing set up to where. Um, uh, what is it? You have sword. Sword is real now. You have that in. Uh, you have that in Wandavision when uh, Monica Rambeau, who was in the very first uh, movie. Well, not movie. It was, she was she made her debut in Captain Marvel as a kid, but the adult version, who was Photon, is now in going to be in the Marvels. So my question is, why in the world, um, the Supreme Intelligence? Thank you, thank you, come on, thank you, Skip and Tosh, thank you, um, the Supreme Intelligence. But back to what I was saying, um, you introduce. Monica Rambeau as a kid, we all know that that is supposed to be one of the the strongest version of the of, of the whole. I'm gonna call it the Marvel family because Captain Marvel, the white version, came after the black version. That 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 was the whole thing. You had for her first her name was the Captain Marvel, which was Monica Rambeau, then. When the female white version came out, you made the uh, um, you named her Photon, and then you named her Spectrum. And the whole entire time that she was Spectrum, you had another person that was with her, that you later made her mate, but she was all already stronger than him. But now in the comics that have come out recently, they're at even power level. One was negative energy and one was uh, positive energy. And I'm pretty sure the people that you guys know who I'm talking about is who? I'll wait. Who are we talking about here? I'll give you another hint. He's supposed to make his debut in the Marvels. But please, I want to see, I want to see in the comics who, uh, who these people um who who you think I'm referencing because he's supposed to play a very big part and hopefully he doesn't get butchered by the people that we know have butchered T'Challa. I'm, I'm gonna wait and see if see if anybody in the comments can uh can uh come up with the name. I'll just I'll give you I'll I'll give you this hint. Um his name is uh, let's see. What's his name? Hmm. What is his name? Let's see here. Hmm. 
who let's see here <laughs> adam oh i'm sorry i'm not supposed to say no i didn't say none i ain't gonna say none his last name the name in the name in this superheroes uh and this superhero's um uh name is Marvel. Hence the reason why he's supposed to be in the Marvels. And that's very funny to me. Because you have a whole movie that's supposed to be about Marvels. Basically, every character that has a last last name Marvel. You have um hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna just put it out there. Adam Bashir. Adam Bashir is the love interest, the boyfriend of Monica Rambeau, Spectrum. And now it's to the point where uh, they have pushed back the, um, they've pushed back the, uh, the release date for the Marvels. And I remember saying something to the point where the reason why they're doing that is because they're trying to get Adam Bashir right. Adam Bashir is the living embodiment of a nuclear reactor, of a uh, not some atomic nuclear reactor, but a yeah, Blue Marvel. You got it right, come on, your kid. Um, hmm. All I gotta say is this: if they nerf him. And I hope they, I pray to God that they don't. Because out of all of those characters that they're supposed to put in the Marvels, Adam Bashir and Monica Rambeau are the top two people in that group that are the strongest. And my thing is this. You're adapting the Marvels. You're doing that. Because you have... You have uh, America Chavez from Multiverse of Madness who was punching realities and going to different places. You already have her at uh, Kamataj learning mystic arts, trying to control her powers. You already have that. You have one. That's one. That's one. That's one member of the uh, the Marvels. You have Captain Marvel herself. You have uh, Blue Marvel. You have Spectrum Photon. And then you have uh, who else is supposed to be part of the Marvels? Let's do our research here. You have uh, let's see the Marvels. Uh, hold on, let me look this up. Uh, what is it? What is it? What is it? The Ultimates. That's who it is. The Ultimates team. You already have that going. The Ultimates comic. Let's see here. All right, here we go. Right here. Yeah. Yep. You already have all five people in the MCU already. You have um. You have yeah, like I said, America Chavez, Captain Marvel, Adam Bashir, and uh, Spectrum. The fifth member, who is the integral part of this whole entire thing you trying to kill him off completely and you guys know who i'm talking about t'challa who is the mastermind the, literally the brains and the brawn well not the brains the brawn but he's the brains behind one of the brains with this entire group adam bashir and t'challa go hand in hand in this group and the thing that irks my nerves is when I saw that Toussaint after credit scene, I was, oh my gosh. Do you know how many people would have gone crazy if you saw a whole entire, I want to say, picture this. I'm going I'm to I'm 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 paint a picture for y'all. Um, and I said this in a live with uh with uh Chillmonger. You put T'Challa in a chamber where he's dealing with trying to get the heart shaped herb back into a system per se, even though it was already in a system and endgame. Um 
you see manifold introducing manifold in this uh um uh yeah introducing manifold into this um into the mcu you introduce uh not really missy knight because he's already in the mcu with luke cage but you take missy knight you take luke cage you take uh the crew you take storm introduce her in this movie at the end of this movie and put her put them all into uh, a room where they're praying for t'challa they're rooting for t'challa to get better and you see ramonda who didn't die in this film in wakanda forever you put them all into a room where you introduce Sion, the real brother of T'Challa, who was, who we want, I say, um, was on a war dog mission and was uh, cut off after. Or how, how about this? Sion was dusted for five years. You have him go against, um, uh, hmm. you have, yeah, you see Sion and you have, uh, you bring Wakabi back, you take him out of prison. But the thing is, I, I, I'll be honest, I want him to see, I don't want to see him with uh, Okoye no more. I don't want to see that. Because one thing I do not like is uh, a marriage to where it's dysfunctional. I don't want to see that. Um, yeah, I don't want to see that at all. Um, you have uh, all of them in the room. And I'll, I'll even go, I'll even go, I'll, I'm reaching for this, but I say you bring back a younger version of Wakabi, not Wakabi, but um, of Zuri. You bring in the actual Zerdi. Or how about this? Uh, <laughs> I'll be petty. You have uh, a younger person who is, um, well, no, you can't do that. You have uh, Zerdi back. And it's a younger, more, still be still able to fight version of Zerdi, who is not a part of the spiritual people that do the rituals and whatnot for the heart-shaped herb. You have that. You have them all in a room. And you have the child in a stasis chamber to where he's getting better and healing and healing. Because even in the comics, he's had the heart-shaped herb in his system, but he still got hurt to where he can get fatal blows. And the whole super healing, super healing and stuff like that still works, but he has to be in a stasis chamber. So you have all that and you have the after credit scene to where the child, um, uh, you have all this happen everybody's uh not really grieving but is in a still in a sad state but you zoom in on t'challa and he's going he has his eyes closed and as soon as you get to uh like an avatar you see this happen his eyes come open so he's awake so in black panther 3 you find out that namor has um quote unquote killed his mother and he's thinking well I'll say this. Yeah, you can have Ramon to be dead uh, at the end of this movie, but bring her back in Black Panther 3. Because what I will not have is Ramon to the Queen be dead all because you're trying to make it to where Shuri is motivated to go against uh, Namor. And then at the end of that movie, you had her do the same thing that T'Challa did with Zemo. No. No. We all know if you kill a Black person's mother, you are dead. Point blank, period. Ain't no if, ands, or buts about it. You talk about vengeance has consumed us? What? Is this civil war all over again? No. We don't do that. We are leaving you with the panther's claw on your face. It's the point where you would not be able to be recognized. Period. And I'll even say this. When I saw Captain America, um, well, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and Zemo was running around with uh, Bucky and Sam. That that made me want to throw something at the screen, and I was glad when the Dora Milaje showed up because she said, "We want Zemo. No, if ends up, but you are going to give us to him. We are not playing games. Give us to him now. He killed our king, T'Chaka." That's how we're going to do this. And uh, I love the scene where um, uh, they're fighting uh, Walker, uh, U.S. agent. I love that scene. When he tries to be Captain America, I love it. I love it, love it, love it. And um, it's a situation to where uh, huh, 
you have a whole bunch of uh, things going down to where you have a U.S. agent and you have the Thunderbolts being set up. Um, I don't know if that will be a good segue into the rest of Phase 5. And to me, the Phase 5 that, in my opinion, would be good, you have Black Panther 3, you have Doctor Strange 3, I'd say do away with Thor Thor 4. Well, no, I'm sorry. We already had Thor 4. My bad. Do away with Thor 5. Bring in Iron Man 4. And, um, yo, Theo, how you doing, man? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I wish, I wish it, I wish you could be in here with me right now. I really do. As a matter of fact, where you at? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm about to get you in here, man. Yeah, we're gonna we gonna get this thing rolling. Let me see if I get you in here. Um give me a hot sec, y'all. Uh hold on. I'm gonna see if I get you in here right quick. Cause I, I was I wanted you to in here. I need you in here, bro. Uh right, let's see here. Uh let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh Theo, Theo, Theo. Hold on. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. Um, mm. The um, <laughs> the thing about uh, Wakanda Forever and the Black Panther franchise, it goes like this. All right, okay. <laughs> all right, okay, all right, cool, cool, cool. I ain't gonna bother you, Theo. Go ahead, man, go ahead. But uh, I will say this. When it comes to the writing and the vision that I have for the Black Panther franchise, even to the point where I mentioned, um, I'll say this. Um, hmm. When it comes to the Black Panther franchise and the fan fiction series character that I've created for this, um, there's three things that I have, and I constantly have dreams about them. Um, One, you're going to have to recast T'Challa, point blank period. That's how this works. That's how the feelings go for the stories that I've created, everything. Um, The character that I have created is a part of the royal family. He's a distant part of the royal family to the point where they have to find out who this guy is because he's solidified with the Jabari and the border tribe. You have that. You have, um, he has uh, a war, I don't want to say war, but he, his father is a part of the Hatut Zaraze. His mother is a retired Dormelage, honorary Dormelage. Both his parents are part of the military. Um, his lineage, and when I mean lineage, I mean his love for Wakanda, his thrive for Wakanda comes from a deep longing to be home. And I don't want to say this is a, it's like a killmonger s story, but I'll say it like this, it's a flipping of the Killmonger story. You have T'Challa seeking him out because um, he finds wind. What's up, Ronnie J? How you doing, man? Thank you, bro. Thank you for being here. You have a flipping of the Killmonger story. T'Challa finds out that he is taking on the Black Panther name, the mantle, in a different country, protecting a whole different resource for a different country that where uh not vibranium but adamantium came from and so um even even with adamantium it's a different aspect of adamantium because we all know that there's two different versions we have the one from the very way back when uh when captain america shield was made we have that version and then we have the we have the uh recent version the actual version which is vibranium was given to um Steve, not Steve Rogers, but uh, yeah, 
it was given to Steve Rogers via Anthony Stark, but T'Chaka, um, T'Chaka's father, Azuri, gave Vibranium to um, uh, Anthony Stark. I'm sorry, not, um, Ed, oh shoot, I forgot the father's name. Lord of mercy, Jesus, I can't even keep up with the name, Starks. Who is Tony Stark's father? <laughs> Who's Tony Stark's father? Howard Stark. I'm sorry. Howard Stark. So you have uh, Howard Stark receive vibranium from Azuti during World War II. Um, my character, um, I'm pretty sure if you guys go watch um, the introduction, the videos that I've made on my fan fiction, and I'm going to be making fan fiction, uh, more fan fiction episodes. Um, he goes and studies uh, adamantium. The name of my character is Ndala. Um, he is a decorated shield agent. He grew up in America via his parents. Yes, Ronnie J, thank you. <laughs> it is Howard Stark. Um, he grows up in America and he is essentially trying to find his way in Wakanda. And that is via the help of T'Challa, who is basically his big cousin um the chala is dusted for five years we all have the question who was running wakanda this that and the third my character was doing that the chala and i don't mean this in a bad way he was grooming him uh to the point where he taught him the ways of being a king and being a warrior king in that sense um, he taught him the ways of the throne, the many ways of catering to the people, because this is what it's all about. Being a king in Wakanda, you make it to where you care about the people. And the one thing that I have that is intriguing stories is my character is trying to follow in the footsteps of T'Challa, but he takes it a step further. Um, when it comes to the embassies and whatnot, uh, T'Challa does not establish. I don't even know if the Wakandan embassy is established in a, in, uh, in America in the MCU. That's one thing I've always wondered: is the Wakandan embassy near the Avengers Tower? Because you set it up in the first Black Panther movie to where um, the buildings that T'Challa bought to where Injobu was killed. You buy that building. You buy the whole neighborhood to where uh, Killmonger grew up. And you say you're going to put schools and stuff there. You're going to teach technology and you bring Shuri. And you tell her that she's going to run this whole entire, um, not the whole entire thing, but you have the technology aspect she's going to run. Which is another thing. You didn't complete that setup. You set it up in the very first, in the ending of 2018's Black Panther, but you don't go through it in the second movie. Instead, you have her still in Wakanda dealing with trying to bring her brother back or save her brother from death. It doesn't make sense. That's one thing. You have uh, her. Mo you have Queen Mother Ramonda in place of T'Challa going to the UN, talking to the UN about invading Wakanda, invading their basically their outreach centers, trying to take Vibranium. While that may be good and the whole entire way they did it was great, T'Challa would have them in body bags. Yeah, this could have been a step up. T'Challa shown his savageness, saying, don't mess with Wakanda. We don't mess with y'all. Stop messing with us. And we're not going to let you colonize us like you did our other brother and sister countries. We're not going to let you do that. Hence the reason why they're uncolonized. And to the point where um, <laughs> the funny thing is, uh, you have the Jabari tribe who were brought in, which was funny to me. You brought the Jabari tribe into the council, and to the point where you have all the Jabbar, you have all the clans, all the tribes being represented in one with the uh, council, which is true that happens. But when you have a a clan slash tribe that was isolated for over over a thousand years that did not want to do anything with the main 
version of Wakanda, not really main version, but the rest of the world, the rest of the nation of Wakanda, and they come from the mountains. And the funny thing to me is when Mbaku mentions, um, yes, that is true, Kamoyo kid, they do, the Wakanda NMC is mentioned in the uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes. That's the one thing that we that I saw. The Wakanda Embassy is in New York with the Avengers uh, HQ. So we have that, but we don't have the Wakanda Embassy in the MCU. We don't have that at all. You you could have mentioned that in the beginning of Wakanda Forever, where you could have had her stay in the Wakanda Embassy. You could have Queen Mother visit or just stay there and then go back to Wakanda. You could have had that. Shoot. And the one thing that, uh, like I said, my character embarks upon a journey of self-discovery and he embarks upon a journey when he becomes king to put different things in place if Wakandans want to, like I said, outreach programs. He not only keeps Wakanda safe, but he is making things to where he was doing something similar to what he did before he was in Wakanda. Because my character goes from uh, um, Uganda to Wakanda because those are sister countries. Um, actually, he was in two countries, Nigeria and, and Uganda. But the whole thing with the character that I have is he is at a standstill. Um, put your mind in a certain place where he does not worship Bast. And this, yes, this might ruffle some feathers, but he has an agreement with Bast. My character grew up, um, my character grew up uh, worshiping Jesus Christ. Um, the reason why I did that was because I do not see a lot of things being shown in media where you're only using Jesus Christ as a temporal, um, as a temporal, like you only mention him certain, uh, in certain things. Um, the clash that I have, well, not really clash. It's just a clash between gods basically, or deities. Um, Bass meets Jesus in the ancestral plane. If you could paint a picture to where, after my character does the actual rituals of becoming Black Panther and King, he doesn't just fight somebody, fight one person. He does the um, the actual uh, ring fighting like they showed in the BET special. He fights six warriors. He goes through training. He goes through everything that he has to go through with um, being able to take on the mantle of Black Panther and become King. Um. He is uh, a, I don't know, he's not a spitting image of uh, T'Challa, but he is a um, protege of T'Challa. And he was at the battle of uh, Wakanda during Infinity War, but he was told by T'Challa to stay behind to help Shuri because he is smart. He's very smart on, on well, a little bit above Shuri when it comes to smarts and knowing things about technology but he was the one helping her trying to get the stone out of vision's head in uh infinity war um <clears throat> he is and i'll go back to what i was saying about uh the rituals ritual combat um he takes the herb after completing all of the um the uh needed things to become king he wakes up in the ancestral plane he sees bast as he's walking towards bast somebody's walking with him that person being jesus christ uh when bast talks to him he's not talking to uh bast himself jesus christ is speaking up for him he tells her three things one, he does not worship you, he worships me. Two, he's going to have the power set that you gave to Chala, but I'm going to add on to that because the kings from past that have faith in me 
are going to have uh i forgot the scripture that i was going to quote but um the way that my character is portrayed with the uh character of um with the power set of uh the black panther he has a reigning domain of worshiping jesus christ when everybody else goes to worship bast and uh the stories that i've had that i've created um is to a degree where uh he's given visions from jesus that he wants wakanda to be a certain way um that strays away from what happened with egypt um it's a very interesting thing where we know with Moses who led the uh um led the oh shoot I'm blanking on that Lord oh, mercy Jesus led his led uh, God's people away from Egypt and oh Lord they we all know the Bible stories all I'm saying is this God tells him stray away from uh, keep the people away from the uh my wrath because i will i will do egypt all over again if i have to if these people do not get their act straight and even though um they worship a whole nother deity um he just makes it to where he's doing the right thing at the right time and the writing that i put into this the ideas the research into different uh into egyptian culture and to uh, the part where I have watched different uh, movies and videos. The one show that I would like you guys to watch, The Israelites, thank you, Ronnie J. Um, the one thing that I have watched, and I'm pretty sure if, um, uh, uh, give me a second, y'all. All right, I'm back, y'all. So, um, hmm. the um, the whole entire premise around the um, creation of my character, it comes to a point where he. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the show that I want you guys to watch, American Gods. Uh, Orlando Brown, who plays Anansi the Nigerian trister spider god. There is a king two. Well, I'm pretty sure if you guys have watched this, uh, there are two speeches that he has. Uh, the performance that Orlando Brown gave, who was Dr. Lee in, uh, in Drumline, the performance he gave with Anansi, I immediately went back to my writing and research and I said, I need Anansi to be in this fan fiction series that I had with the MCU. Because Anansi, um, uh, all of these other gods that are in Egyptian and African culture, they need to be in the MCU with the Black Panther franchise. Um, the person who played um, the person who played uh, oh shoot, what is her name? The Queen of Sheba, um, Bilquis. She needs to be Storm. I've been on Twitter in the past and I've seen her making reference to her playing Storm because she is a very avid uh, Marvel Comics uh, reader and she does cosplay that is out of this world, even to the point where she did a whole entire, um, uh, she made reference, I think the um, Orisha were made reference to in the American Gods TV series because um, uh, the, Whole entire thing when it come when it came to, um, when it came to um, just being able to see everything when it um, when her just her performance with the Queen of Sheba and the way that they made that look, it was great. Um, they had different uh, cultures in the American gods. They had the um, they had the uh, Greek, not I'm sorry, they, they didn't have, well, yes, they had Greek, they had Demeter. They had um, Odin from North mythology, which was the, one of the main characters. 
Um, you had uh, who else? You had Anansi. You had uh, you had two Egyptian gods. You had uh, mm, what was it? You had not Set. You had uh, shoot. What was it? Let me see here. American gods. Uh, cast. Let's see. So you had. Let's see here. You had Ibis. You had um. Uh, you had uh. Who else did you have? You had Jackal. Um, you had the uh, Ibis and Jackal were basically. Um. You had the uh, the god of death, and then you had the one um, Anubis and Koth, the goddess of thought, who was recording everything. Little known fact: Chowet Boseman played Toth in Egyptian. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Gods of Egypt. He was the only black god that was in Gods of Egypt. And the one thing that I always, uh, <laughs> the always, uh, the one thing that I um, uh say is it's very funny to me how we portray different versions of um different versions of egyptian gods and deities and we don't actually do a whole series on them because the one thing that i have um that i have basically just advocated for and i plan to do when i get into the industry myself is Black stories need to, be need to be told by people that have done the research and want black people to play the characters. Um, when it comes to, uh, let's see, when it comes to just the Moses story that has been told from uh, Christian Bale's point of view, that was set in Egypt, it's in Africa. We don't have people that are fair skinned that are in Africa. They didn't have that back then, they didn't. They didn't. And if you tell me, if you tell me it did, you might want to go read the Bible again because they didn't. Um, hmm. The Moses story. Jesus. I'm getting off topic. Please forgive me. Um, there's just a whole plethora of stories that need to be told when it comes to. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Daria. Let's say thank you for that. Um, I'll say this. The MCU has to come to a point where do they want to go back to catering the fans that they were, are supposed to cater to, which is us, people that read the comics and do the research and actually read? Because reading is fundamental. We like doing these things. And I'll say like Theo, he grew up, he learned how to read through comics. He read the source material. He grew up on Black Panther comic books. So when you have people like that, that pay attention to what you do with the characters in the MCU, you're going to have people that criticize to a T, to every little dot and dot and every I and crossing every T, to everything that's done when it comes to being able to learn these characters, to know their stories, Yes, you do back. Yes, you do origin story films. Yes, that's how you create things. That's how you create universes. But the one thing that I've always said, and I keep to this day, you have to keep the character development the main thing when you're making movies. You did a good job with Tony Stark, Iron Man. You literally ended his story. You're doing the same thing with Captain Rogers. You ended that story, even though you shouldn't have. Because when it comes to these next couple phases, you're going to have Iron Man and Steve Rogers going up against the big baddies. You have Kane, who was supposed to be Reed Richards' great great grandson from the future. You haven't even had Reed Richards introduced into the MCU yet, and you're introducing Kane. That does not, that's beside the point. I have not watched. Ant Man, and I'm thinking I might have to do that just to make content. But from reading the comic books, you have had certain things to come to a hold or come to a forefront to where Nathaniel Richards is supposed to be the main bad 
for the rest of the next three phases. Now, when that phase is done, the top three things should already be in place. The future foundation with Peter Parker leading the way or having Mr. Fantastic lead the way because he is the one who is supposed to be the smarts that's behind the future foundation. You are supposed to have all these other young kids. You even had it to where, um, what was it, the uh, power pack. You had those kids that are supposed to be the leading foundation with the uh, future foundation of uh, kids that is the next generation of superheroes coming up. It's basically the future foundation is the Legion of Superheroes version of the MCU of, of Marvel period. You have, um, what else is it? You have the uh, Peter Parker, even of itself. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to sleep, bro. I got stuff on my mind, bro. Uh, you have, um, oh, shoot. <laughs> you have a whole bunch of stuff going on when it comes to just a story standpoint for the MCU. Um, at the end of phase five, or just uh, phase six and seven. That's supposed to be, I think, the um, X-Men saga. And even with that, you have you have to have a big baddie set up for that. And I think that might be Apocalypse or some other big X-Men villain because oof, you can't have Magneto because that's subpar. Magneto's always going to be there. Magneto's always going to be one that's at the antithesis to Professor X and what he's trying to do with uh, trying to make, make the world accept, not really make the world accept, but try to have the world accept the mutants that have already been established in this previous movie world, kind of forever. You have Namor, who was the very first um, mutant. I don't understand that because if we are introducing mutants, the first two mutants that were already mentioned were Pietro Maximoff and Wanda Maximoff. Those were the ones that were already mentioned. So you cannot have the mutants be, well, just the name mutants. You have the term mutants be used in uh, Wakanda Forever, even though you know that the mutants are going to be a pivotal point when it comes to Kang. And I've seen and heard different theories where Kang said he was delaying the mutants or just erasing the mutants from people's minds because they know that if the mutants were around and kicking with the Avengers, he wouldn't have no chance to invade the different timelines that, oh, excuse me, that he had in place because we know that, um, let me see, what is what Kamala said? That will require the MCU to actually be invested in telling well thought out stories. This is true because, and the funny thing when you said that, Kamala, when you say that, Kamala, the way that they started the MCU was very spot on. You had Iron Man, which was a very comic book, um, uh, comic book X film, and that made movies. That made that made that made good money. When it came to Iron Man two, you didn't really have, I'll say, you didn't have. Um, it didn't go well. I'll say it was the more subpar movies of Iron Man. Iron Man three to me was okay. Uh, Mr. Sinister, I need to do my re I need to do my research on that. Mr. Sinister might be an actual villain that might make some problems for both the X Men and the Avengers, because, um, like I said, he's might he might be one of those universal um, villains for both the uh, both groups. But even with that, you have um, certain things there in place already that has to be told to a T and I'll say this the X-Men to me are very very sensitive and you have to think about how the X-Men were made back in the day the X-Men were around during the 60s and they told a story that was mirroring the version of the civil rights era um it told a story to where mutants were basically black folks um 
mutants were frowned upon. Nobody wanted to be near mutants. Nobody wanted to be associated with mutants. Um, when the mutants, uh, so quote unquote, cure that was refer referred to in the X Men Three movie, you had mutants up and ready to take it because they wanted to live normal human lives. Um, I'll say this: when it comes to the X Men. You need to have a certain degree of establishment already going on. And I've read and heard this too. Uh, the theories that have gone around that the X-Men were already established and they were just in the hiding. They didn't want to do anything with the world. And that would be a different kind of thing to put out there. Because I'll say that the X-Men, when it comes to just... Professor Xavier and everything that he represents, and then you mirror that with Magneto. Um, it's very, very, very interesting. Because when you bring Magneto in, he's going to automatically go after his children because he's like that. He's one of those parents that don't play around with his kids. The island of, of Krakoa, where Magneto makes a whole, basically a utopia for uh, mutants to be and basically like he has his version of mutants that want to be together that he calls the brotherhood you have um professor x that has his children that have the uh that teaches young kids the younger generation of mutants and what would be interesting is the power pack when i say the power pack you have those five kids that were um i don't really know if they were children from past generations of superheroes but I'm pretty sure they are associated with the Fantastic Four uh, to the sense where they have a sort of kinship to the two kids. And I, it, correct me if I'm wrong. The power pack are the, um, the two kids that are in the power pack are Nathaniel and um, not Nathaniel, but uh, the two kids from Mr. Fantastic and Sue Storm. So you might have that. And the one thing that I would like to see is, um, and I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm going I'm to tell y'all a fun fact. Fantastic Four 3, uh, that was supposed to be coming out after um, Rise of the Silver Surfer, it was going to introduce T'Challa with Digimon Hoonson, who plays um, uh, the, I don't say, subpar villain uh, in the very first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Um, let's see, hold on. Because I actually have him on here. Um, Captain Marvel. Cast of Captain Marvel. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, Digimon Hussein plays Korath. That's who he played in the um, both Captain Marvel and in Guardians of the Galaxy. He played Korath. So, Digimon Hussein played T'Challa in the 2006-2000... Um, uh, yeah, no. It was 2005. He played in the 2005 special BET, BET special for Black Panther. And when he did that, I do believe that, yeah, 2005 was the same year that the first Fantastic Four movie came out. Jump ahead two years later in 2007, the second Fantastic Four movie comes out. After that, um, Tim Story, who was a black director who created the first two black, um, first two Fantastic Four films and uh, directed them. He had plans to introduce uh, T'Challa with the Fantastic Four. And I'm pretty sure if we had that film, we would have seen a comic book accurate movie introducing Wakanda in Warner Bros. And that would have been, I don't want to say bittersweet, but we've already had that. Uh, we already had a black franchise with Blade. And that came out in the, early, in the late 90s uh, in, going into the early 2000s. Um, it's just an interesting thought to see how all these previous projects that were up and coming, because we do know that Blade saved the Marvel com Marvel brand and kept them from bankruptcy. Um, and even to the point where Blade is supposed to come out in the future, and we've all seen, we've all heard the news about Blade with Mahershala Ali, and it's just a situation to where. Mahershala Ali is one of those guys where he's not going to take no crap. 
he wants things to be done the right way, even to the point where I'm pretty sure when he saw the news with Black Panther, he was like, my character is supposed to be with that dude. We're supposed to cross over at some point. And when Eternals came out and his voice was in the very first, was in the very ending of that movie, my mom was like, hold up now. You got him with the Ebony Blade and the, uh, I forgot the night that's supposed to be in that movie. But you have him saying, are you sure you're ready for that lifestyle? Are you really about this? And you're just in that on that. And you mentioned this movie in 2019. I, you got to get something straight at some point. But uh, but yeah. Those are my thoughts for tonight, guys. Um, I'll be coming at y'all with another one. And um, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, coming into this live. Everybody that came in. Um, I'll be making more videos, coming out with more episodes, and um, I'll see y'all in the next one. Thank y'all, and uh, please like, share, subscribe, and um, yeah, keep up with your boy. All right.